Major funding for this project has been provided by the University of the West Indies and additional funding by Trinidad Cement Limited. Dr. Bruno Mitchell and Republic Bank. fires seem to blight the nature ripening into art not the fierce noon or lampless night can quail the comprehending heart Caribbean Nobel laureate Derek Walcott might as well have been speaking about the scientist among the litany of the islands within the amen of calm waters Welcome to a different side of the Caribbean. Join me as we take the lesser beaten path to explore the scenic and scientific route of what is going on in the Caribbean in terms of the science that is happening here. What are our scientists up to? This question became a quest that turned into an adventures into discovery that took us halfway across the Caribbean from Trinidad to Antigua. And this was just the ocean's shore. First stop, Montserrat, a place once known as the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean. Today half the island is devastated from the fury of the volcano, creating a region known as the Exclusion Zone. Most of the residents have migrated and those that remain live on the safe side. Dr. Nico Fournier is a volcanologist who works at the Seismic Research Unit at the University of the West Indies. He spends a lot of his time at the Montserrat Volcano Observatory. When he's not busy monitoring and trying to understand volcanoes, he enjoys his other passions in life, photography and music. He told us what went on behind the walls of MVO, the observatory that faithfully looks at the Soufrière volcano night and day. The Montserrat Volcano Observatory is the research institute in charge of monitoring Sufrio Hills Volcano in Montserrat. And this volcano has been active since 1995, literally starting to erupt again in 1995. Um, the way we monitor volcano here is by putting different types of instruments on it, like seismometers, which will record the ground vibration, small earthquakes. Um, we also use what we call global positioning system, GPS, which is looking at slight inflation of the volcano, like slight swelling of the volcano. We also look at the gas composition to see how it's evolving through time, whether the chemistry of the gases emitted from the volcano are actually changing all the time. So that, that's something we always look at. And there is a team of scientists here coming from different parts of the world, and, um, and a huge part of them coming from the Caribbean, who work here 24-7. There is literally a monitoring 24-7. Before 1995, Sufria Hills Volcano in Montserrat was not really very active. It was not dead, it was dormant, but it was not doing anything. Although for the past hundred years we have signs, we had signs of activity, small seismic activity, a bit of earthquakes every 20 years, but that was pretty much about it. But in 1995 we started to actually have an increase of the activity and the volcano really restarted to erupt again. And from 1995 onwards till the present, the volcano has been acting all the time 
with big eruptions, periods of rest, uh, periods of small eruptions, dome building eruptions, and all this is cu well probably culminated in, uh, in 2003 when we had the biggest dome, lava dome ever on the island. So 1995, we started to erupt again. 1997, that's when Plymouth, the capital, was totally destroyed by the volcano. And then from then on, we've had several cycles of activity till the present right now. From here onwards begins what's known as the exclusion zone. This area is not open to the general public for their own safety. If you would like to see what the devastation in Plymouth looks like after the eruption of Mount Sufria volcano, it's something that you actually cannot walk into or do. Those regions are totally closed off for one safety and you're not able to get into those regions. However, there is another way we can do this. And this can be done with a flyover by helicopter. And guess what we're doing this morning? So when we, when we monitor volcanoes, we have to be in the field pretty often to check on instruments which we put there to see how the volcano is behaving, record data, uh, check on the volcano itself. But most of the time, we, especially at Sufri Hills Volcano, we just can't go to the field with a car because it's too dangerous. So there are many cases where the sites are simply inaccessible. And for that, we use the helicopter. And the helicopter is a great tool because we can use it for observing what's going on on the volcano. And we can also use that to land in areas which we couldn't reach otherwise. And then we can check on the instruments, came back, come back on the helicopter and, and move around to other sites. From time to time, nature shows us who is in command. As we have seen with Sufria Hills Volcano, as it unleashed its fury on Montserrat to become a modern day Pompeii. That out of difficulty there is often opportunity and what you see behind me is that this region is used for mining for the growing construction industry in Montserrat, an opportunity for economic growth. Next stop, Antigua. Here we saw science having another impact on the residents of the island, an island famous for its tourism. This time, it was a battle where a community was fighting to save its heritage against the forces of progress. Bendels is a quiet little village nestled at the foot of Greencastle Hill. This hill held many secrets, some which the scientists in the Caribbean were only now uncovering some 1,000 years later. We knew this hill was going to be worth a climb. Who says that science isn't adventure? We've just finished climbing a hill that's almost 500 feet, so I really do need to sit down now. But it was well worth the climb. At the top of the hill, there are these megaliths that appear to have been put there by the Arawaks that occupied this area some 1,000 years ago. And what's really interesting is that in, they appear to have some kind of astronomy significance as well. Around 2001, Dr. Maura Imbert of Trinidad looked at the positioning of these rocks. And it appears that it's not just merely coincidental where they've been put down, but there were certain star systems that were of interest to the ancient Arawaks. And these star systems positioning seem to be correlated to the location of the rocks or the megaliths. So, is it possible that right here in the Caribbean, we have something akin to an ancient Stonehenge? That's something truly worthwhile. Well, if the research that we have done proves positive, because you must remember it's only a preliminary step, 
We could only look at 18 so-called megaliths. It will be the only megalithic site in the whole Caribbean and the only place really where any archaeoastronomical research has been done. And it also will do a great deal to throw more light on the history of the Arawaks, who are known to have inhabited Greencastle Hill, because an excavation, a dig was done in 1995 by Dr. Murphy, and they found artifacts of flint and bone and pottery. Funnily enough, not on the plateau, on top of that hill where the major megaliths are, but just around the sides, as if the plateau had been left for some specific purpose. So, as you know, all over the world there are megalithic sites. The, the best known one is Stonehenge, but there are ones in the Mediterranean, in South America, and so on. And usually these megalithic sites are astronomical calendars of some kind. So, should this turn out to be an Arawak astronomical calendar, which we're hoping to do, well then, think of how important that will be to the tourist industry in Antigua, and also to the historian of Arawak history. Much of the history of Antigua is captured at the Museum of Antigua and Barbuda. The museum curator, Mr. Edward Henry, recounts the ongoing battle to save the hill. The Antigua masonry products, I'm talking now years later down, came in, they leased the area and they started to blast. And a considerable amount of the damage that has been done to the hill is what we now see today. Perhaps about quarter, half its size, original size. I don't know. I'm told that a line has been put where they should go no further. I hope that this is so. Yard Isaac, like many of the other villagers, is deeply concerned about the future of Greencastle Hill. Here in Antigua and Barbuda, in the community of Bendels, we have a very unique treasure. It is called the Greencastle Hill. It's unique because of its, of its historical significance. We're hoping to let it be a heritage site, and that's one of the reasons we are trying to preserve the hill, not only for our generation, but future generations to come. at the Cave Hill campus at the University of the West Indies in Barbados. Barbados is well known for its sun and sand. Perhaps what it is a little less well known for is some of the science that's happening here. Areas of science that it's actually world famous in. Believe it or not, it is in the world of sugar canes. Not only that, we are going to be looking at the geology of Barbados and the marvelous formations and structures that occur here. So today, it's an exciting journey into caves and canes in Barbados. Beauty can sometimes turn an ugly face. Tragedy struck on the island of Barbados, an island famous for its beautiful caves. At such times, scientists at the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology jump to the forefront because of their critical role in disaster management. If, for example, there's a disaster occurring on site, you want to know what's the expected conditions um, in terms of the weather forecast. So we can utilize the models to give us what we call a non-casting. Um, you know what, um, if you expect precipitation in the next hour, in how much you expect, um, wind speeds, etc. And we internally tested our models in the event that happened here in Barbados at the Britain Sail Cave in, and they performed fairly well. Some of you may be familiar with the cave collapse at uh, Ashcott in St. Michael, which claimed the lives of people. Part of what CIMH is involved in is assisting the government of Barbados with uh, looking at the stability of the Ashcott area in terms of looking at the geology, hydrogeology and geophysical data that was collected at the area. By putting these together, we're hoping to look at the safety, not just of the Archcott area, but trying to develop a suite of tools that we can look at the safety 
of other parts of Barbados and that technology and methodology can be exported to other karst islands within the region which may suffer the same fate. Barbados is a cast island with limestone features. This means that it has very little surface water. The water quickly percolates underground. Its water is hidden in caverns and pockets. Hydrogeology is very important to Barbados because of the island's tremendous need for accessible water. A number of people are studying the subject of hydrogeology. That is, how do we get water from underground? Water, which is another major natural resource, which is now gaining serious importance because we perceive that the world, world will um, run out of fresh water or, or we will reach the, the, the limits. The supply will, will, will not be able to sustain uh, the demand in, in the very near future. Scientists in Barbados continue to address the issue of water, a natural resource one can no longer take for granted. In exploring the scientific side of Barbados, our adventure was not over yet. Sugar has played an important role in the history of the Caribbean. The scientists at the West Indian Central Sugar Cane Breeding Station recognized that the same sugar cane was now critical to the future of the region, in a different role altogether, not just to satisfy a sweet tooth, but as a biofuel. Dr. Sishal Gri Rao is the director of the breeding station in St. George, working on this new research. Sugar cane breeding was discovered in Barbados. What happened at that time, until that time, Generally, population does not know that you can grow sugarcane plant from a seed, that is from arrow, from the flowers. So up in the highlands estate, one of the workers found a small grass-looking seedlings growing, and then he checked it and he thought it was sugarcane. So he reported to his um, supervisor, and then that was the first time in the world you can grow plants from a sugarcane seed. And that's where cane breeding started. So we have two oldest breeding stations in the world, one in Barbados, one in Java, Indonesia. We know very well the price of sugar is going to fall or the money we get from the one. So we need to find to raise added value to the sugar cane. So this is, comes in a time where energy, that is energy in the form of fuel, alcohol, or in terms of electricity is important. So sugar cane has a new life we are from sugar cane in the factory from bagasse you can produce cogeneration which produces electricity which can be supplied to the population consumers also you can take molasses make ethanol which can be added to the gasoline and so you can have liquid energy also you can make um, ethanol directly from juice by putting right kind of bacteria right kind of temperature which brazil has been doing so in the caribbean we have good land and around the year cane growing and we know how to grow cane, we have expertise and we have machinery. So if we can convert sugar cane into a high fiber energy cane, we have long future and it will help us to save the foreign exchange and also energy security. Coming from, uh, um, what I'm trying to show here is that one, this is what you call high fiber energy cane. This has been bred in Barbados around 1979-85. We got few varieties now they are being tried in Barbados to produce ethanol and electricity along with sugar. Main feature is that one, these canes are normally thin and they have a lot more canes compared to commercial canes. Also they produce sometimes very tall and thick cane and here you could see the internode is about 30 centimeters length comparing to ordinary cane is only about half of the one. This is a growth of in one week. So what you are having here is a high biomass product, produ production per unit area, which you can convert into ethanol or use it in factory for electricity. Final stop, Trinidad. Living in a tropical region of the world carries with it its own pleasures and challenges. The same tropical forests that lend to the magnificent array of life forms are also home to a lot of mosquitoes. Certain strains of these mosquitoes carry the dengue virus, which could be deadly at times. 
Dr. Christine Carrington, a scientist at the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the University of the West Indies, works on understanding the evolution of this virus. Her typical day begins with a morning workout with her son. Biking, shall we say? One of the reasons that dengue hemorrhagic fever and dengue diseases in general have emerged in the Caribbean, one of the reasons we're seeing more um, epidemics more commonly, more frequently, and more severe forms of disease because, um, because of man's activities, urbanization, deforestation, all these things encroaching on forested areas. The, in the case of dengue, rapid urbanization um, results in, without proper planning, results in the, um, the expansion of areas with poor infrastructure, um, not enough, you know, inadequate water supply, so people store water, then you get mosquitoes breeding. So basically, man's activities are increasing the number of breeding sites for the vectors, the Aedes aegypti mosquito. So it's a pattern that's seen all over the world. As you get rapid and uh, more urbanization, you get an increase in the amount in dengue in tropical regions. One of the major questions that remains about dengue is why some people get dengue fever while other people get dengue hemorrhagic fever. Um, dengue fever is a febrile illness. You have a high fever, aches, pains. It's very painful, not very pleasant at all. I had it twice. Um, but um, it's unlikely to kill you. It's not, you're not going to die from dengue fever. However, in a minority of cases, the dengue fever can develop into what is known as dengue hemorrhagic fever or even dengue shock syndrome, and those are life-threatening conditions. And we need to understand more about why some people get dengue fever and why other people get dengue hemorrhagic fever. And so I'm interested in the actual virus itself. And in particular, we're interested in how the virus evolves over time. So what we spend our time doing is capturing mosquitoes or collecting samples from people who have been infected and then trying to isolate the virus from those samples. And then we sequence the viruses. That, that means we work out what the genome of the virus looks like, its genetic sequence. And we compare that virus to viruses that were collected in the past. And various things about the virus that will help us to better understand the future of the virus. So by investigating its past, its evolutionary history, we're able to project what the, what the future might be. Trekking through forests is just another day in the lives of the researchers. It had been pouring incessantly before our trip to the forest. The stream we needed to cross was much higher than ever before. The problem was quickly solved. Nothing discouraged the researchers in their effort to improve the quality of life for the people of the Caribbean. Come on, okay, that's not how you walk to the water. You walk and mix some of your stuff. Science has many faces and purposes. It impacts our lives beyond satisfying a curiosity and a passion to understand the nature of things. I am here at the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies in Trinidad, where a lot of science is happening. Our short journey today took us halfway across the Caribbean and we saw that science is at work to protect us, has social implications, anticipates and addresses our personal and regional needs as a unique society and affects our health and well-being. All working together in harmony to improve our human condition as a people of the region. Imagine how much more is waiting to be discovered. <laughs>